All right, well, welcome, everyone. My name is Kim Wilkins, and I'm very excited to be here with uh, Catherine and Carrie Ann. We just want to uh, make sure to thank the sponsors and supporters of the Global Education Conference. Um, this is just such an amazing um, opportunity, and just wanted to say last year, I did this conference as a participant, and it was so inspiring, and so many great ideas were shared that uh, this year, I wanted to uh, participate as a, a speaker and a collaborator. So this is the third session I've been part of, and um, amazing experience. If you have ideas uh, that you want to share and get collaborators on, I would highly recommend um, being a speaker next year. So I'm going to uh, enable the blackboard, and we, I mean the whiteboard, sorry, and <laughs> we'd like to see uh, where everybody is from. Yes, that's my age. Um, so if you press the star, that's the second one down, you can place your star on the map. Lovely. Great. And let me... All right, so here we are. Um, this is what we're going to go through. We're going to talk about who we are. Uh, we're going to talk about the underrepresentation, underrepresentation of girls and women in technology. Um, we bring some unique perspectives because we're from three different countries. We also deal with three different age groups. So um, I think it's a, a great um, overall view of things. Um, and then how we're using social media to make connections and inspire the next generation. And then what's next? Not only what we are planning on doing next, but what kind of things are you doing? Are there ways that we collect, could collaborate? Um, things like that. So quickly, uh, we just wanted to find out a little bit about you. So we're going to ask you, um, and we know that you might be more than one of these, but in the session today, what do you feel most like? And I'm going to um, get the polling for this right. This is A to C. All right, so if you just go in there and the polling is right, um, it's, it's the fourth icon over or under your name. All right, so seven others, one, and let's see, I, I think I can figure out how to get this on the screen. There we go. Hmm. No students, that's tragic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. All right, so now, um, if you're an educator, which of these, um, well, let me clear it. Okay, now to go. Um, which of these do you uh, are affiliated with most? Primary, secondary, post secondary, or other? Yeah, secondary all the way. <laughs> <laughs> Any other C's? Mm -hmm. All right, let me just post that up here. There's where we go. What was that? Looks like um, secondary and post secondary. I feel like it's high. Do we need to get your way? Okay, so who are we? So, so my on. name. Hi, my name is Carrie Ann Sylvan. I'm a Google certified teacher and I'm a secondary school teacher of ICT or um, in America I believe it's called Tech. I'm not sure, I might have to get a clarification on that one. Um, I'm also responsible for the curriculum at Key Stage 3. So in the UK that is between the ages of 11 to 14. And we're in interesting times at the moment in the UK with regards to what we're teaching at Key Stage 3, which I will talk about a little bit later. And I'm also the founder of a project called Geek Girl Diaries, again, which I will get to in a bit. The whole idea being um, to try and get more girls into IT technology. I'm from London. Um, I teach in um, Dagenham in London. Um, I teach in the fourth poorest borough in the UK. And we do have a problem getting girls into IT. Sorry, that's me done. <laughs> Okay, thanks Carrie Ann and thank you
you all for being here in the session. My name is Catherine Cronin. I am speaking to you from Kinvara in County Galway in Ireland. But as you might be able to tell from my accent, that's not where I'm from. I'm originally from New York City, but I've been in Ireland for almost 20 years now. I am a lecturer in IT at the National University of Ireland in Galway, and I'm also academic coordinator of our online IT programs. So I've been working for 30 years, really, since I got my first degree. And I've worked in industry, I've worked in the community, and I work in academia. I still do a lot of liaison work with schools. Um, but my focus at the moment really is on online and open education, digital literacies, and social media and education, and uh, mentoring and supporting and connecting women in technology and engineering is a big part of my work in all those guises. And my latest initiative is something called IT Women, and that's what I'll be speaking about tonight. So thank you. All right, and my name is Kim Wilkins. I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia. I've been in computer science and technology for 25 years. Um, I first started in industry. I was at IBM for 12 years. And then I had a web design business with my husband that uh, we ran as a small business. Um, somehow I found myself in education. My best friend um, thought I should um, help set up this technology lab at a school. And uh, then I just wound up uh, teaching technology, and I loved it. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I really uh, found out about this underrepresentation of girls um, studying computer science and uh, really decided to focus on that and so have now become the founder of Team Tech Girls, which is what I will tell you about in a bit. So uh, we're going to talk about the underrepresentation, underrepresentation of girls and women in tech um, from our own perspectives. I'll start with mine. Um, so I'm coming from the U.S. perspective, but also uh, I am mostly focused on uh, K-8 to uh, and what's going on in that um, area. So the, one of the things I discovered, I went to the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing in 2010. And uh, at that point, I discovered that women studying computer science made up less than 20% of those studying computer science. And that just blew me away. Um, doing a little more digging, I found out when I graduated in the late 80s, it was 37%, because I knew that it wasn't equal then, but um, I felt like it was in the right direction, and I couldn't believe that it had uh, deteriorated so badly, and I wanted to figure out, you know, what was going on. So a couple of things um, that have come out recently uh, through studies through the Girl Scout, um, .diva, uh, there's many different um, studies that have all worn this out, but obviously it's the stereotypical images that abound with computer science, that it's hard, it's boring, it's antisocial, it's irrelevant, and these um, stereotypes just persist, um, and they're not being broken down um, early enough. And the reason for that is um, another study found that girls by age 13 determine a positive or negative attitude towards subjects like computer science. So in the schools in the United States, we don't even have computer science curriculum. That's one of the reasons I went to the Grace Hopper um, conference, because they had a K to 12 track. And I thought, this is great. Maybe I can learn about some curriculum out there, because I was making it up. And with my computer science background, I was including tape programming. The kids were loving it. But I just wanted to make sure I was covering all the bases and found out there really isn't anything um, standardized out there. And even with, uh, there's something called the Common Core going on in the United States, which many states have signed up for. And even in those Common Core standards, there are um, no standards that are related to computer science. There's plenty of technology-related ones, but nothing about computational thinking, problem um, solving, things like that. And so if girls aren't even being exposed to this um, subject uh, before they turn 13, and then they've got these stereotypical images, uh, they're going to put that off the plate. They don't even consider it. Um, so I just thought that was very um, interesting and uh, worrying um, finding. And so what I've been doing is I've been meeting with girls um, the last year and asking them, um, you know, so when I say computer scientist or talk about computer science, what do you think? And this is from the last group of girls I met with um, just about a month ago. And you can see they've got um, all sorts of ideas. Uh, it's, you know, you need to be smart, it's science, it's math. Um, so some of that is right, but it's, you know, 
you have to be as smart as Einstein <laughs> to get in computer science. Um, they have this perception of aloneness. Uh, people laugh at the 57 cats, and you know, where did that come from? And I'm like, well, you know, maybe that's because you're alone and you want to hang out with your cats. Um, they do appreciate that there are uh, so many in the field. I haven't got one. I haven't even got one cat. <laughs> okay. The 57. Okay. Quite precise. Like right. Um, so anyway, there's definitely, uh, and, and this, it, every time I, every time I've sat down with a group of girls, this, it goes very similar to this. Um, and then I've also been sitting down with educators to um, ask them what they think is going on. And they tell me that um, girls don't think they're smart enough um, to do things like computer science. Uh, they feel that the packaging and publishing of STEM materials, even uh, curriculum materials, are marketed toward the boys, um, and so that's a problem. And they they've experienced when uh, boys and girls are in a group and they're doing activities, often the boys will dominate, and so even if the girls had initial interest, they'll kind of back off. Um, so these, you, you can see, um, I'll share this wall with you, with you and if you're help, I'd welcome more um, input into this wall wisher about what you see as problems. Um, but those are just some that were shared with me recently. So um, in the UK, I'll start right at the top. So at present around, I mean this figure keeps changing this percentage, I've seen it written a few times, but roughly it's around about 20% of IT professionals in the UK are women, which is quite a small percentage of the overall population. And if we take that step down to kind of university level, only 15% of students on IT related degrees are female. So that's even less. So that means there are kind of less girls going into this um, sector of work. We we'll take another step down to um, A level, to sixth form. And in 2010, only 361 students were female taking a computer, a computer relating A level. And if you compare that to um, a topic like psychology, you know, there's 40,000 girls took psychology A-level, which is um, quite worrying, really. And at key stage four, which is a step down from A-level, um, I find in my teaching, because I teach that age group between uh, 14 and 16, that the majority of my classes are boys. So for the last two years of intakes, I've had class sizes of around 25. And only four of those have been girls. It's got a little bit better this year, and um, seven of my class are girls, so I like to think I've already had some kind of impact and girls are uh, starting to take the subject again. But it's um, a real issue that girls aren't taking the subject. And it really made me stand up and notice and say, well, what is it we're not doing, or what is it we're doing wrong? Why aren't girls taking it? And this thing, what Kim was saying about girls making up their mind at the age of 13 what they think about my subject is really important, especially as I'm in charge of that kind of age group curriculum. I think it's really important that we tackle that issue. And if we go to the next slide, um, there's some other problems and issues facing um, the uh, technology education at the moment in the UK. Uh, the education, um, the Secretary of State for Education, Michael Goat, in 2011, he listened to some feedback from the industry, the IT industry, who told him that not enough um, young people were going into um, computer science related jobs and that the intake they were getting weren't, didn't have the education to really get involved in computer science and start programming. So what he did was he withdrew the National Program of Studies, the National Curriculum. So the curriculum that I'm in charge of, Key Stage 2 curriculum, at the moment it doesn't exist. We don't have one. So we have the opportunity to teach what we like, which in some ways is a really great idea because it means I can move towards um, moving students to being um, creators of technology rather than consumers of technology, which they have been for some time. But does that mean that all schools, all um, people in charge of IT education are going to take this opportunity to really engage girls, to really change the curriculum, to really give students the opportunity to create technology, or is it just going to go downhill? If there's not a standard that everybody's teaching, then are girls going to be drawn into taking ICT? And currently, um, ICT, computer science, whatever you want to call it, it's not a compulsory subject. But in 2014, 
Uh, Michael Gove is going to give us our new curriculum, by which point it will be a compulsory subject. So at the moment, girls and teenagers generally can choose it as an option for Key Stage 4, so between 14 and 16, takes GCSE or a BTEC or a qualification. Um, but that choice is going to be taken away from them. So is this a good thing for getting girls into IT? Are we going to force um, something they don't like on them? Is that just going to make the situation worse? We don't know. But I think it's really important that when we are discussing ways of getting girls into technology and into IT, we should really be concentrating on shifting away from teaching kids how to be consumers of technology, how to use products on the computer, and instead become creators of them. And I think that's a really important point. Okay, thanks, Carrie Ann. Um, I'll be talking just about a few things about uh, Ireland. Uh, it's quite striking, Carrie Ann, Kim, and I realized when we spoke together that we're talking about three countries, three different sectors of education, and we, we kind of span three generations, if you like. Um, and these proportions are remarkably consistent. So in Ireland, for example, 15% of full-time undergraduate students in both computer science and engineering are female. So there's that 15% number again. Um, and like in the UK, ICT and computer science is not a compulsory examination subject at second level. At second level, um, we have a junior certificate examination when you're midway through second level and then leaving certificate um, at the end. And the secondary curriculum is loaded. Most students do between 9 and 12 examinations at the junior certificate level. And ICT is not an examinable subject. So, you know, where do you find the space to do that? So it is happening in some schools, but it's very challenging. Um, and there is, there is reform of the junior certificate um, being planned, but that is still a few years out. And if we, th there are some positives though. Um, there are some really exciting links happening between educators across primary, secondary, and third level in Ireland through something called EdChat IE. Uh, I'll put the link in here. Um, and teachers are sharing resources and what they're doing, and certainly at primary level, a lot of really interesting things are happening um, because there's, they're less constrained by, um, by exams. Um, and another thing that's, of course, emerged in the last year and a half, uh, born in July 2011, is Coder Dojo, which many of you have probably heard of. And that's um, really just a network of free nonprofit coding clubs started by James Welton, uh, a leading third student in 2011, and Bill Liao. And as I checked the Coder Dojo website today, and there are now 125 dojos globally. So they're forming at a rate of more than one per week since Coder Dojo was born, which is quite amazing. And um, they're, they're really driven by peer learning, um, unstructured learning, driven by the kids, um, children and young people across all ages helping and mentoring and learning with each other um, with uh, adult mentors. And some, there's some exciting things going on there in terms of uh, underrepresentation of women in that there is a high incidence of girls participating in Coder Jojos, and certainly as far as I've been able to find out, and a high number of women mentors in many of the Jojos. And there's an awareness in Coder Jojo about trying to break down some of these stereotypes that have persisted um, in IT and computing. So that's quite exciting. Um, I think I'll leave it there for now because we want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about the social media aspect. Great, thank you. So uh, quickly before we get to the social media aspect, I just want to um, say why this is a problem. Um, it, it's obvious, I think, to, to many of us, but um, technology is you know, fundamentally changing the way we work and live, um, how we govern, how we educate. And if uh, women and girls are not at the table and not participating in a way uh, of making decisions for what's going to happen next, um, that's a huge problem. Uh, Douglas Rushkoff has a book called Program Review Programmed. And I mean, I think the title itself uh, really says why this is a big issue. Um, so, Carrie Ann. So, how am I trying to change the world? Well, um, I noticed very early on that a lot of girls weren't taking um, up computer science or ICT. And I started to think about ways that I could get girls into technology. And what I thought about was when I was younger, because I didn't have a direct route into 
IT. I kind of went this weird roundabout way and ended up being um, a web designer and a systems administrator before I became a teacher of IT. And I thought about what would have influenced me when I was younger. I thought about how teenage girls and just kids generally don't have access to people who are working in um, industry. And with social media being as it is, and especially YouTube, we have this opportunity to bring these two worlds together, to give kids access to people they wouldn't normally have access to, without it being a dangerous kind of um, situation, a child protection situation. So I decided um, to make a YouTube channel. I noticed that a lot of my students, um, if they were searching for answers to something, or if they wanted to learn how to do something, they would actually search YouTube rather than searching um, using a search engine. So I started to notice how they would use YouTube. And something that's become really um, important on YouTube is people have started to set up channels where they have kind of weekly episodes, and you can subscribe and catch up on the news. Uh, exciting things to be happening on that channel that week. So I thought, well, maybe I can do something similar. So I came up with this idea of it being like a geek girl diary. Maybe um, girls who are into IT and technology would keep a diary of their interest in what they may do. So the videos that are on this channel, there are a combination of different types of videos. There are some video logs, which are kind of like diary entries that are made by myself about different things maybe I've done that week or something about tech. Um, I've also got how-to style videos, most notably there is a video about um, setting up a Raspberry Pi, which I'm sure Alex who is watching would probably enjoy. Um, there's also a video on building a computer. There's also, most importantly, interviews with women working in technology. Um, I put a shout out on Twitter and so many women um, replied back um, were, wouldn't mind being interviewed. We do them online, so I've been able to interview people in America people who have worked for NASA, people who are white hackers, you know, these fantastic women who students in, you know, Dagman just wouldn't have access to normally. And finally, um, I got in touch with some computer science graduates who are girls, and they um, take part in a kind of panel discussion. We have one about, on average, once a month, where we take a topic, like do we think the term geek is derogatory, and um, we discuss that for a little while. So it's kind of like a little talk show. Um, once a month. So it's quite a range of different things. And this project um, recently has been nominated for a Digital Heroes Award. And um, I'm a finalist in the London area. And at the moment, people are voting. The deadline for voting, if you want to vote for me and for this project, um, is Sunday. And I really need your vote. So I'll put the um, address for voting into the chat so that you can vote. Um, so I think it shows that this website and um, these videos really do have something to say and are important. I've had a lot of people get in contact with me recently asking me where I want to take the channel, where I see the future of it. And I know that teenage girls are watching them and signing up for it because I have a Facebook page. And in my classroom, I don't tell my students about it. And girls around the world are finding this channel by themselves and they're liking it on Facebook. And every day I've got teenage girls signing up to the Facebook page. So I know it's something that they are interested in and I'm getting more and more subscribers every day. So that's how I am trying to change the world in just a kind of little way. And here are some, <laughs> I took some um, stills of some of the videos just to give you um, an example. You can see all of these videos on the channel. If you go to YouTube and just put in Geek Girl Diaries, you'll find the channel. Or you can go to the website, geekgirldiaries.co.uk, and the videos are on there as well. So you can see one where I was building a computer. There's one where I had an interview with, um, the brilliant Zoe Cunningham at Softwire. Um, you can see one from our Google Hangout where I talked to some other um, computer science graduates. There's one about um, making vector gra graphics. And the one right in the middle is me dressed as a whoopee cushion in honor of the fantastic world you've got. Okay. <laughs> Terrific, Terry Ann. Thanks very much. Uh, I will kind of shift gears a little bit just to talk about uh, kind of out of the school context and talk about where the ratio that we're talking about, the 15% ratio, really plummets. And in fact, I'm seeing even in the chat that in a lot of school situations, for, for some of you who are participating here, um, that number is less than 15%, a good bit less than 15%. But certainly in positions of authority and influence and visibility, the proportion of women in IT computing, um, engineering technology is very low. 
and one example of that is um, a conference, an IT conference that took place in Ireland this summer in August. I received an invitation to it at the end of August. Uh, it was quite a high profile conference and it had glossy pictures and bios of all the speakers and I scanned down the list and there were 20 speakers at the conference and one of the speakers was a woman. So I immediately sent a short email to the conference organizer just stating that you know I was very disappointed to see um, you know, the low numbers of, of women speakers at the conference and that I thought that it was important for all of us who are doing work that's so visible to be, to be aware uh, of what we're doing and to promote diversity and greater representation of women because we send out a very powerful message um, to our peers, to students, and so on. So um, that 5% number is, is not atypical. This was just one particular conference. Um, I also sent out a tweet because I got a response from um, the organizer saying, uh, what many organizers say, I tried to find women, I just couldn't find them. So my first impulse was to, you know, to fire off an email listing about 20 women that I could think of right off the top of my head, but instead uh, I decided to tap into my personal learning network. So I just sent out a tweet, um, this is the 31st of August, saying, um, does anybody have any suggestions for women speakers um, at, at an IT conference? And the response was overwhelming, um, and from all, from all different countries, uh, on the next slide is an example of uh, some of the conversations that happened. This is only last week. People are still retweeting and finding, um, finding the blog post. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat here. Um, so that Jane McGonigal, some of you might know Jane McGonigal. She's a game designer and she's got two terrific TED Talks. If you haven't seen them, one I think was 2010 and another was this year, 2012, about gaming leading to resilience. Uh, and I think her 2012 talk is about how gaming can add 10 years to your life. It's fabulous if you haven't seen it. But these kinds of conversations were happening, and I, what I wanted to do was try and capture these resources. So uh, the next slide shows also some of the groups that I found out about. So there was a JavaScript uh, conference this year go going on at just about the same time as I was tweeting about this. Uh, and the organizers had implemented a procedure to try and get 25% women speakers. So they have a really detailed blog post about how they did that. I found a group in Australia, wonderfully called No Chicks, No Excuses, uh, women who just um, responded to the same kind of thing that I did by saying, you can't find women to speak at your conference, well here's a list of women. Um, and what I did was I collated all of these resources that I found, and on the next slide there are two lists um, that, that I shared. Um, again, I'll put these in the chat. Um, the first is just called the IT Women List. And the IT Women List is a list of all of the suggested women speakers and, and the blog posts, like the JS blog post and the No Chicks, No Excuses. So it's a resource that can be shared with conference organizers. Anybody that you know that's organizing a conference or a workshop or anything, and it's organized by country of women in IT um, and related to IT who are willing to speak at conferences. It's a fantastic list. There were 60 women after the first day, 100 after the first weekend, and it's approaching 200 now. The second list is a Twitter list, and that is a list of a lot of the organizations that I began to find out about, like Finding Ada, the more recent Girls Who Code, the Grace Hopper computing um, seminar, and so on. So again, if you're active on Twitter, you might be interested in checking out that Twitter list. You might know some of the organizations that are there, but I certainly found out about ones um, that I hadn't known about before. So um, the, the two outcomes were really the, um, the Twitter list and the IT Women list. Um, on the next slide, I just wanted to share um, one postscript to that, and that is that in the mid-1990s, I participated in a research project looking at gender and um, what was called at the time SET, Science, Engineering, Technology, which we now call STEM. And we looked at the previous 20 years of data of women in science, engineering, and technology. So we're talking about research that I did 15 years ago that was looking back 20 years, so that's 35 years of data. And the problem is very, very persistent, and it's across all Western countries, certainly. And the outcome of the research project is very detailed, but this is just a short summary. Um, really identified three different positions of um, women and STEM, if you like. The first is um, our, our initiatives, mostly government funded and Department of Education funded, that recognize STEM's strategic and economic contributions. So they don't necessarily look at science and technology as anything but objective and neutral. Um, they don't really look at gender either. They just say we need more women and we need more men in science, technology, engineering, and maths. 
Um, so initiatives such as things like you know, more computing in schools, uh, wider access to HE, encouraging STEM careers, things like that which are offered to both women and men arise out of that position. Those are all good, but they're not good enough. The second position is recognizing gender stereotyping um, and gender socialization, if you like. And that's saying that, hey, wait a minute, uh, women haven't had a lot of these opportunities because they might not have access to, um, to the subjects or to the opportunities to, to play around with you know, computers, for example, or games. So we really need to have special focus on women and try and promote the quality of opportunity for women. It's kind of a, kind of a liberal ideology here. Um, and these initiatives encourage more girls and more women into, into STEM and provide mentoring, support, networking, and so on. And while this has been an essential step forward, we have to recognize that it hasn't been terribly successful because there have been initiatives like this for upwards of 35 years. So we have increased the proportion of women in the fields, but not terribly. I mean, we're really still talking about 15 to 20 percent. So the third position that's recognized moves even further than position two, and that is recognizing that science and technology are socially constructed. So for example, um, people say that the culture of STEM is the culture of masculinity. Um, in studies that have been done where people describe the, um, the attributes of femininity and the attributes of masculinity, the list of attributes of masculinity matches almost perfectly the list of attributes of an engineer, for example. So girls may experience potential conflict between their own feminine gender identity and the masculine culture of STEM. So the people who advocate this position say, um, we, don't, we don't just want to fix girls and fix women. It may not be a fact that, they, that they're not seeing the opportunities. They may see very well uh, what the culture of STEM is like, and they're making choices. Um, that they don't want to go there. So in addition to encouraging girls and women, we really need to work to change the culture of science, technology, engineering, and math. And from an education standpoint, uh, the kinds of things that we can do are our curricular and pedagogical changes, for example, where we might look at more you know, humanist and social problems when we're solving engineering problems and computing problems, more flexibility in curricula, um, more opportunities for um, communication, collaboration, teamwork, et cetera. And these are things that generally all students respond well to, um, but are particularly um, positive um, interventions for female students. So um, all of the things that we're talking about here really are probably come from positions two and three. And we just wanted to present this as kind of a backdrop to what we're trying to do. Great, thank you. Um, so. I, like I said, this since 2010, uh, in that Grace Hopper conference, have been thinking about um, what I could do to help. How could I change um, the, uh, the equation, if you will? And uh, I've been gathering a ton of resources, uh, a lot of data, a lot of. Um, there, there have obviously been a lot of people doing work in this area. Um, if you've heard of that data before, they have some great videos. They have some great um, resources. So it was just. Um, you know, a good solid year and a half or so of gathering versus resources and trying to figure out, okay, what, you know, how could I um, enter into this picture and help out? And then I heard about um, the International Day of the Tech Girl. Oh, no, sorry, the International Day of the Girl um, that the UN set aside on October 11th. And um, I think I heard about it in August or September. And I thought, okay, that would be a great way to get in. Um, the door with this, uh, with helping out with tech because they set this day aside to uh, show that empowering women and girls um, can have economic impacts, it can have impact on um, violence against women, it can have impact on uh, not just the economics of the females themselves, but if you bring um, women up in economics, the whole society uh, benefits. And uh, we know that uh, a career in technology and getting um, experience with technology is also a way to empower uh, women and girls. And so I uh, decided to um, pursue something called Day of the Tech Girl. And I knew I couldn't do it alone, so I put some tweets out and I started a Google Doc. And uh, Carrie and Catherine are actually some of the first people who responded and said, yes, I'd like to help, and here's what I could do, here's what I could do. And so this Google Doc just grew and grew um, with ideas and um, 
of things that we could actually do on uh, October 11th as well as how to continue it on throughout the year. So I'm just going to take you on a quick tour of the results of this effort, which is a website, and I'm going to put it in the chat if uh, the web tour doesn't work. All right. Um, so we've got a, a place to collect ideas here. Um, and um, also, this is where the Twitter feed is. And you can see we've been talking about this conference. Uh, the hashtag for getting on this tweet, Twitter feed is Tech Girl Day. Uh, we also have uh, Carrie Ann's work uh, with her Geek Girl Diaries. And you know, when I when I saw what she was doing, I just thought that was fantastic and um, a really great tie-in. Uh, we also Carrie Ann in a classroom here uh, actually. Um, well, we tried to meet live, but we wound up making videos for each other on the actual uh, day of the Tech Girl. That was fun. I'm also collecting uh, creations that girls have made. And so if you uh, work with female students and they're um, doing some tech creations, we'd love to put them on here. Uh, you can, um, if you click on the Create, you can go to Submit and get more creations on here. I'm also uh, been listing out all the different things, uh, ways you can take action if you're ready to take back that step. Um, Carrie Ann's uh, Digital Hero Awards project is there. I just found out uh, Black Girls Code, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. They just um, are now part of a filmmaker competition, so there's a way to help for them. Um, you can share things out. You can advocate, and mentoring is just huge. And then I've got uh, this is where I've shared all the resources that I'm collecting. And finally, uh, I've got a newsletter that's going to go out monthly. So that's kind of where uh, Day of the Tech Girl is. Let me get back here. And I just wanted to share quickly this uh, the, sto the, the story and the power of social media has had on me. So um, Skill Crush is a, a website and newsletter I follow. And I highly recommend, if you don't follow them now, you should. Uh, they are geared toward women, and what they do is they provide, they de demystify a lot of technology terms. Um, they've just started a, uh, a website design uh, tutorial beta that you can get into, um, and they put out uh, ideas of here, why don't you, you know, here's something you could try. So right before Halloween, they came out with this newsletter, and it said, hey, you could, you, you should try to raptorize your site, and here's, a, you know, here's a list of resources that you could do that. And I thought, well, that looks cool. Um, I hadn't done much with JavaScript before. And uh, I'm using Weebly to create this site. And I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool to um, try this out. What it does is a raptor comes up and um, roars really loudly. It's very sudden. Um, so I uh, spent a little time um, trying to work with that. And I got it working. And I was very excited. And so I shared that back with Skill Crush that I had done it. And they were very excited. And we talked about you know, what I had learned in the process. Um, and that has turned around this week. I got named their skill crush. So they, every um, week or so, they have uh, somebody that they highlight, and they call their skill crush. And so that has then led to more traffic to the website, to the Facebook page, um, to all sorts of things. So it's just a really great um, way for, uh, to see how social media can play. So um, next, we wanted to talk a little bit about what our uh, plans are for the future. And then we'd also love to hear your ideas. Um, so let's start with ours here. So um, for Geek Girl Diaries, um, there's quite a few things in the pipeline. I think obviously the first thing is this Digital Heroes Award. If, um, if I win that, then um, there is some funding. If I get that funding, there's some things I want to do. And one of the biggest ones is I really want to run a hack day. And I've been in contact with um, Computing at School um, kind of inclusive section, which is called Hash Include. And the lovely person who runs that is a lovely woman called Laura, Laura Dixon. And we've been emailing each other back and forth for some time. We've come up with this idea that they're going to run hack days on the same day. So there's going to be one in Manchester, I think. There's going to be one in London. I think there's going to be one in Surrey. So we're all going to run a hack day on the same day. And we're going to try and get um, industry experts in, maybe some women who work in technology to come in and help us run days where we're going to have lots of teenagers. We're going to have boys as well as girls. But we're going to try and get as many girls on those days as possible. 
Um, I also want to develop some lesson plans and some resources that include maybe some of the videos from Geek Girl Diaries. And we can use that um, to um, give out to schools so they can just run this very short lesson plan or scheme of work um, to try and show girls that technology is cool. Um, obviously, I want to do more interviews with women. So if you're a woman working in technology or you know a fantastic woman working in technology, um, wherever they are in the world, because we can use wonderful technology to be able to record interviews online, then please um, put them in touch with me. I'd really love to interview them. And the weekend just gone, I was at a Mozilla Festival, and I was talking to the guys there about running you know, hack days in conjunction maybe with a summer code party, maybe running workshops, maybe using like Mozilla Spaces to be able to run something. So getting as many people involved in that, IT teachers, technology teachers, people who work in the industry, and developers, geeks, whatever, want to get everybody in the same place, all working towards the same end, getting kids into creating rather than being consumers. And I put the Raspberry Pi logo in there as well because um, I'm hoping to um, really utilize the Raspberry Pi. If you don't know what that is, um, where have you been? You really should know what one is by now. It's a little tiny computer that doesn't cost very much and you can do very cool things with. And I'm hoping it, you know, running a hack day using a Raspberry Pi is going to be um, really good, really inspiring for young people to think, well, you know, I can change the world. So that's what I'm, uh, uh, I'm hoping to do. Hello again. I, uh, I'm getting all caught up with the chat. There's lots of great chat going on. Um, in terms of my own plans, and I hope that we have a, a little bit of time to, to hear more from all of our wonderful active participants. Um, one of the many, many fantastic resources that, that Kim has uh, in, the, in the Teen Tech set of resources is a, is a great Prezi, which incorporates some statistics and a couple of wonderful videos encouraging um, girls and women into computing, and it's available. Kim, you might pop up the link to that, that Prezi um, while I'm talking. So I connected with Kim over the summer, and there's a few of us in Ireland who want to create an Irish version of that. So we would plug in the Irish statistics and use the existing videos because they've got some wonderful um, uh, tips of, of you know women in IT, young women in IT that are really great. Um, so again, there's a few of us who are planning to create an Irish version of that. So that's on the cards for the next couple of months. And we're hoping um, that to grow the IT women idea as a resource for women for the tech industry and for education. So one of the things that we did, for example, was to submit a proposal to the South by Southwest um, Education Conference. Again, just to try and get the idea out there and, and see what other ideas people have. I think we can take um, the resource further because although it was supposed to just be a resource for conference organizers, it ended up being a great resource for women in IT. Um, so those are just two ideas. Again, as some of the people who are in the in the session here, Mary Loftus, Pamela O'Brien, um, Trisha O'Connell, are people who I'm going to be working with to do this. So um, thanks for being here, you all, and um, I'd be happy to continue the conversation with anyone else who's interested. Great, thanks. Um, so this, these are the uh, things I'd like to go forward with. One is um, Black Girls Code has just really um, taken off here in the States. Um, they are uh, reaching girls of color, which have even even worse um, representation. I think it's less than 5%, so it's really abysmal. Um, and I'd like to bring uh, activities like that to um, Charlottesville. Um, I already work with Computers for Kids, which is a local nonprofit that works with um, disadvantaged kids that uh, you know, may not have a computer in their own home. Um, this program, what it does is that uh, it's a mentorship program, and after being mentored for nine months, um, the student gets uh, a computer. And then they have something called Teen Tech, which I kind of um, borrowed their name for Teen Tech Girls, uh, where there's a whole lab that they have access to do things beyond um, what they did in their mentorship. And I just started working with them. They actually, uh, somebody was mentioning, you know, don't you need to start earlier? And I do agree that um, it really, it, as early as possible, I mean, K-8 K, K area is not too early to start with computer science. Um, but it's not also too late to start with older kids. Um, I've been working with some girls in high school and um, the, the 
and the people at Computers with Kids weren't, you know, sure exactly how that might go. But they, we, we just wrapped up one session, and they all want to go on to the next session. So I'm very encouraged by that. Uh, we've also brought Coder Dojo into Charlottesville, so um, involved with that, and really encouraged um, seeing the diversity of um, participants. Especially again in K to eight, they're very diverse, and it gets less and less so. So that's it's that um, somewhere in the middle school, high school range that we need to figure out what's going on. Um, and finally, I'm going to continue collecting resources for Dave Tech Girl. I'd love to have more collaborators. I'd love to have um, people interested in uh, making, creating articles. If you've got something you're doing you'd like to share, if there's an event um, you have going on throughout the year that you'd like to let other people know about, please let me know. Um, and finally, I'm recruiting um, actual teenage girls to be an advisory council to Teen Tech Girls. Um, so again, if you know girls, uh, uh, teenage girls that you think would be interested in um, being an advisory council, I don't think it really matters where they are. We can always um, connect uh, up um, virtually. So those are kind of my next steps. And I think now we would love to hear uh, your questions, things that you're doing. Um, We'll open it up, and I'm, what I'll do is I'm just going to turn on the audio for everybody, and you can uh, either speak in the microphone or um, write your questions in the chat. Um, O'Brien, your comment is interesting because when I first started doing research in this area, it was called gender and set, science, engineering, and technology, but now it's STEM because it includes mathematics uh, because I think that has been recognized that a lot of the kinds of things we're talking about equally apply in maths um, as well as um, some of the harder sciences, technology, and computing. So, Catherine, I see Hi, that Catherine. you... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, I wasn't sure how to go by doing this. Just um, on the, the maths, when I was doing um, maths in school, we would have done, say, ordinary level and higher level or honours maths. And out of a group of 120, there were only six who did honours maths. And that's in 1986, so it's a little bit, it's a little while ago. But I went on to do it an, or, uh, an undergraduate degree in mathematics. And again, there were 20 odd and there was three girls in maths. So it was quite a high proportion of girls, but it was still not the thing to do. So one of the things I'm wondering about is uh, I met with some educators that where computer science is part of, part of their classes, but they also do the business classes and marketing classes, sort of anything associated with technology is in this group um, in, at the high school level. And they're seeing a drop across the board um, in girls, whether it's computer science or it's any of these other courses, um, even um, graphic design, and one of the area, one of the areas they point out as a problem is that counselors, school counselors, don't recognize the value of, um, you know, computer science and uh, studying it. So I'm wondering if other people are experiencing that as an issue. Funny enough, um, I was at a conference, I was at Python in the UK, and I was asked to sit on a panel where people were asking questions, a lot of people were asking me about the state of computer science education in school, and then someone said, um, he put his hand up to ask a question, but then didn't ask a question, he just made the statement that he didn't think that young people um, should be programming, and I couldn't really understand why he thought that. Um, so I think there is still, even people in... Um, Sort of the technology industry who don't think that kids should be programming, let alone girls. I wondered if anyone else came up against that as well. Well, I have Carrie. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, there's a post, and I'll try to find the link for it, that Audrey Water just uh, 
question about should computer science be required? And um, I actually used in that the responses in a talk I gave to um, the Computer Science Teachers Association because there is such confusion about what computer science is. Um, people were comparing it to, well, you don't need to know how to fix a car, so you know why would you need to know how to program? And it was just, you know, there's definitely some um, misinformation, misunderstanding out there about what it is. Um, can I just follow up a point that's been coming up in the chat just about the gendered nature of um, some sciences and technology and computing? Um, and Alex has another question there. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, one of the observations that's been made about looking at the, the representation of women in, in a lot of different fields is that in, we'll say, as recently as the 1970s and early 1980s, there was still very low representation of women in. Um, fields such as veterinary science, um, medicine, law, um, you know, traditionally there were, there were low proportions of women in all of those. But uh, while the proportion of women has gone up in, in all of the ones I just mentioned, the underrepresentation of women is, is intransigent, it's persistent in, um, as I said, things like physics, engineering, and laterally computing. And, it, and the explanation that's um, about the, the gendered nature of those fields um, it rings true because we're applying a lot of the same uh, encouragements to girls to enter these fields and yet girls are, are either not choosing them or they're going into them and they're leaving. So um, one of the encouraging things that's come up is a lot of the curricular and pedagogical changes which have been suggested actually appeal to, to male students and female students and also create a greater diversity across all um, categories of students. We're talking not just gender but race and class as well. And if these are the fields that are creating the solutions by which we all use every day and by which we live, it's so important, isn't it, that we have you know, a great diversity of students in these areas. It's, it's incredibly important. So, um, so th that's really all I wanted to say is just that w once we recognize that there are these very strong gender stereotypes around the fields that we work in, um, we who are in the fields um, really need to think about what we can do to change those. Yeah, another thing you'll hear over and over again is, especially girls, they want to change the world. They want to make a difference, and they don't see that connection um, with uh, computer science. And it's you know, it's hugely possible to change the world with uh, programming and technology and computer science. So. Um, any final comments or questions? I'd love to hear. Um, there's just some great things coming up in the chat. If anybody wants to add anything before we have to sign off, we'd love to hear some of what you're doing or, um, or your ideas or questions. So just put our um, Twitter accounts up, and we're very active there. And I think we would all love to carry on this conversation if you um, are interested in uh, following up. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And thank you very, very much for attending.